welcome back to Endurance Icons, where we sit down with individuals who are excelling and inspiring in the wide world of endurance sports. Today, I am thrilled we have the incredible Haley Smith on the podcast. Haley is a mountain biking and gravel dynamo. She's a Tokyo 2020 Olympian, Commonwealth Games, and World Cup bronze medalist and mental health advocate. In 2023, she won the Canadian Cross Country National Title and took second at the Cross Country Marathon World Cup race in Snowshoe. And that's just the tip of the iceberg in terms of all of her accomplishments. So welcome to the podcast, Haley. We're so happy to have you here. Thanks. Thanks for asking me to be on. Of course. So talk to us a little bit about your journey into professional cycling. How did you begin your career? So I was always an athlete growing up, um, primarily dance and hockey were my things. And then towards the like middle end of high school, I started to ride bikes a little bit. It was something my dad and my brother did, um, only mountain, no one in our family rode sort of drop bar bikes, but I basically followed a very progressive journey. Like I went to a couple local races and found that I was kind of good at it and, Then I went to some Ontario cups and then I started going to, went to my first Canada cup, went to my first national championships. And then just the results at each of those would get me sort of invited to the next level. So results in some Ontario cups got me on the provincial team. And then those results got me onto um, the provincial team to go to nationals. And then a result there got me onto my first world champs team. And it kind of just snowballed. Like it just, Um, obviously there were valleys like plateaus and valleys within that journey. But for the most part, if you look at it on paper, it was kind of like a very stepwise progression through to eventually becoming a professional racer. It just took a lot of years. Yeah, that's incredible. And when we were chatting a little bit before the podcast, you had mentioned that, um, you had originally developed an eating disorder when you were in hockey. Um, how old were you and talk a little bit about uh, that journey that you had early on? Yeah. So, um, I should backtrack a little bit in that, um, and add that I've always kind of dealt with anxiety in my life ever since I was really young. Like it started to kick in when I was, you know, in second or third grade, just, um, yeah, just overwhelming or very abnormal levels of anxiety compared to peers my age. And then, when I went to grade nine, that's when things got pretty bad. So I, I can't remember exactly how old you are, 13, probably in grade nine, um, 12 or 13. And I, yeah, the anxiety I had just about everything just really sharpened and became about food and about physical performance and perfection and like, and, and health. Like I just became extremely fixated. And over the course of my grade nine year, um, freshman year of high school, for those who aren't Canadian, um, I just, I just spiraled basically. And by the end of grade nine, I was, um, severely underweight, really, really ill. Um, I was admitted to, uh, the pediatric inpatient in a, in a hospital kind of near my parents, uh, the pediatric inpatient program, um, and diagnosed with at the time anorexia my diagnosis has since been updated to orthorexia um but yeah it's that's kind of when I hit it happened very quickly it happened over the course of like six or eight months um and since then it's it's just been something you kind of always manage you know well thanks for sharing that and uh, thank you for being such a vocal advocate for mental health in general. I think that not many people are as brave in this space. Um it takes a lot. Um we we've chatted with some athletes that have a have a platform and it is difficult to both focus all your energy on racing and have a platform. So like mm-hmm. thank you for starters. But I think you raised a really interesting point. Um you know, you talked about anorexia and that you've been re-diagnosed or they've adjusted that to orthorexia. For those who aren't familiar in this space, can you talk about the differences between those? Yeah, so I struggle with this a little bit because there is overlap, um, but anorexia nervosa. So when I was initially diagnosed, it was I was diagnosed with anorexia undefined. So it meant that I fit a lot of the um, habits and the, like the manifestation of anorexia, but there were some things that they couldn't quite fit into that box. Um, and that's because orthorexia was not yet a classified disorder, uh, whatever that was like 10 or 15 years ago. Um, so anorexia is characterized by 
like an extreme food restriction. And that's kind of the main defining hallmark. Orthorexia is it all you you have that as well. There's extreme food restriction, but it's characterized by a fixation on um, healthiness and perfection with healthiness. So um, it's not just food restriction, it's extreme exercise, it's the elimination of a lot of food groups that are deemed to be, you know, air quotes, not healthy. Um, and then both disorders also share a lot of things like the, the exercise piece is shared between anorexia, the anxiety piece is shared between anorexia and orthorexia. Um, denial is a shared aspect of both of those things. So when a person um, is in the depths of it, they just can't see it and don't believe that they have a disorder. So lots of shared overlap, but just kind of those, that main distinction is just food restriction um, versus like an obsession with healthiness. And I find one of the things that I find really, I would say, I, I think that there's there's a sinisterness to all eating disorders, but orthorexia, when you really look at what's touted in regular media, when you talk about like eating healthy, et cetera, when you look at some of those behaviors, it is celebrated so loudly. So it, it can be hard to explain to people that it actually is an eating disorder when it seems like, well, that's just healthy eating. Like you, it, like they say, well, eat less Oreos, eat you know, more real food. So on the surface, they say, well, Haley is doing everything that you're supposed to be to be healthy, but there is this whole underlying disorder underneath that. So I can imagine that it's, it is a, a challenge to be able to, to navigate that. Yeah. I mean, man, media is so, it's great, but it's so terrible. And I think a lot of obviously access to the information that we consume through media and social media is um, exacerbates these issues for people. Um, so I, I have a complicated relationship with it, but, um, yeah, like, I, I guess it can look like healthy eating and it's, but then you have to ask yourself, like, what is healthy? Like how, what are, what is healthy? What is unhealthy? And how are we defining that? Is it balance? Because I think that's probably what real true health is, is some, is a, is a balance, a functional balance, but someone who has orthorexia, there is no balance. It's yes or no. So for me, it, it snowballed to the point where like, I basically couldn't eat anything. Like I could eat fruit, but my brain told me also fruit has really high fructose and it's high in sugar. So you probably shouldn't eat that either. So it, it like, it gets to a point where you can't really eat anything because all of it's bad. <laughs> you think all of it's bad and think isn't the right word because there's not really logical thought happening here. Um, but you, your, your disorder is telling you it's all bad. And then you're also being told that being sedentary is terrible. So you exercise all the time. Like there's no, there's no gray area in these disorders. Um, so like, I, like I didn't sit, I didn't sit still ever. Um, one of the, I don't want to, be a trigger to anyone, but one of the things that, uh, symptoms, I suppose, in this disorder is like almost like restless leg syndrome, but, um, extreme jittery jitteriness or like shaking. And it's because your brain is telling you that you can't sit still, like you should not sit still. It's bad for you. So you must always be at least partially moving. Um, anyway, so I guess on the surface at a very high level, it might look like someone is trying to just be healthy, but it's there's like a pathology there a thought pathology that is extremely maladaptive and it's 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 a very much not healthy once you get a close look at it no i completely agree and thank you for sharing that another thing that i, I will give you a shout out for um just understanding you know how entrenched um these conversations can be in the media is that you know as a professional athlete I would imagine a lot of times that you get asked, like, what do you eat in a day? Like what? And, and you're very vocal of like, I will not, um, because that is, that can be triggering. And I think back with orthorexia, there's no, I think you hit the right balance. It's just saying that it's a balance and what that balance is will look different for every single person. And I think so often people look for what is that one way to eat? And the way that you would eat every day is going to be very different than what someone else eats every day. It needs to be adapted to what does your body need. So I think it's so great that you focus on what works for you and not try to 
give those specifications to someone else. Um, because I think mm -hmm. that that is one of the things that perpetuates this problem. Um, but a, a question that I had for you is you mentioned that anxiety was a part of it from a young age. How do you manage race anxiety with the fact that you deal with this in a day to day? So race anxiety has actually been, uh, almost like a, a drill or an exercise for me in learning how to manage anxiety in daily life. So um, I, I used to see a psychologist, a psychologist and a psychiatrist, multiple ISs <laughs> before my professional journey. And I, I found it very, very challenging for me, but it felt, it felt very safe to work with a sports psychologist. And I think it's because we were tackling my problems in the sport world where it's just Sports are made up. It's not as heavy as, you know, real life issues. So um, all that to say, I've learned a lot of these, the, these skills that I've learned through sports actually help me manage the anxiety in real life. So I, I, I almost, and I guess I say that because it means I don't really separate it like race anxiety or race nerves. They're just, they're, they're the same feelings. They're the same, um, same sensation, same physiological response. It's just in a a different arena. Um, so I have my strategies, like I journal, I do breath work, um, talking to people a lot, uh, relying on routines, which you have to be careful that you don't tip over into routines going negative, but, um, yeah, just, uh, action oriented, I suppose. So in the lead up to a race, when the nerves are getting really high, you have your schedule that you turn to that keeps you focused on the moment, as opposed to, where your brain can go. Um, and I guess a lot of it's like introspective work as well that you can't really put as much of a, a label on, but it's like understanding why you're lining up and what you hope to get out of it and working on your confidence and those kinds of things. Um, yeah, just stuff that's less, less like skill-based and more, uh, more like, ongoing psychological, if that makes sense. It totally makes sense. And so you talked about your journey into cycling and very quickly, it was clear that you were an absolute pro at this. Um, how, what did that balance look like? Um, you know, dealing with an eating disorder while competing at a really high level, what were some of the challenges that you found when you began to have success in cycling while balancing this incredible journey that you're on? So I, I should preface that by saying that um, I still have like minor relapses and I have trouble frequently with food. Um, it's not like smooth sailing. So I don't want to give the impression that I've figured this out and I'm a pro athlete and it's all golden. Um, but yeah, I guess I think that becoming, so a lot of times eating disorders are precipitated by endurance sports, unfortunately, and especially with the dialogue that we have in cycling about um, the power to Watts and all that garbage, excuse me. But um, in my case, because it happened before I entered the cycling world, it, it I think that outcomes were a little different. So there are times where my cycling causes a relapse or gives me issues. But for the most part, riding bikes taught me how to eat again, because I, there were, I was young enough that there were some rules. Like if you, you're going to the doctor every month and you're being blind weighed in. And if your weight drops, bye bye bike. Like it's, so there were some rules about it. Um, and so I, I had to learn to eat or I could not do what I wanted to do. Um, and then when you're kind of forced to do that, you also start to see the benefits of being faster and you see these things that, that the outcomes of eating more like I, I don't even want to use the word better because probably someone who had a more um, surface level view of what is healthy or not would say that I was eating worse but actually it was what I needed you know um, yeah so especially for the first few years I wasn't it was like biking healed me like it healed my relationship with food and then throughout time I've had points where it's gotten worse but initially it was extremely positive 
Thank you so much for sharing and reinforcing the fact that it's a journey. I think that so often with anything in life, we try to say, okay, well, like here was my challenge and then, okay, it's done. But I think with anything in this world, it's, it's something that you have forever. This isn't like one day you're going to snap your fingers and it's going to be gone. You are always going to be working through strategies and, and you're going to have those peaks and valleys. And you had mentioned that you know, and you, you sometimes have regression and you've been open that in COVID, that was a particularly challenging time as I know it was for a lot of people who struggled with some mental health or eating disorder challenges. So what were some of the tools and strategies that you use to try and manage during that time? I'm, uh, <laughs> I laugh because uh, I did not do it successfully. So I don't think I employed my tools and strategies well. Um, that was at the time when like Olympic qualification was going on and there was a lot of different things. And in retrospect, um, I fully relapsed. Like I did not handle it well. Um, eating disorders thrive in isolation, partly because it's really, it's easy to, um, hide your habits when you don't have to hide them from anybody. Um, so long story short, I, like ma restricting my food and being obsessive about it was a way for me to have control over a life in which none of us felt like we had any control. And at the heart of it, my thing has always been controlling sort of existential anxiety. Um, so it got really bad. I didn't really realize it got had gotten so bad. And because it happens quite incrementally, I was living with my husband, but there's not really a lot he can do either. And it 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 does happen very stepwise. So it kind of sneaks in. And then before you know it, it's like full blown issue and you have to kind of start from scratch. So um, I guess that's probably my answer to that question is that I didn't employ my strategies or my strategies were not sufficient or robust enough to deal with the huge thing that COVID was. Like it was a stressor that my, um, that like it, it broke the, it broke the dam. Like it was too much for what I was capable of managing. And we did kind of have to start over. So I restarted meeting with my mental health performance or health consultant after, um, after things kind of started to return to normal. And after we had acknowledged that this was an issue for me again, um, I switched disciplines. I actually moved away from cross country Olympic racing and now I do marathon racing. So Basically, that amounts to a career change that gave me a different focus and allowed me to like start fresh in an area that didn't have this baggage. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't know what else to say for that one. No, but. that's I, th I that switch is so fascinating to me. Like, walk me through that part of that journey for you because that's a big deal to switch sports. We were talking before, like you were going for the Paris Olympics in this sport to say, okay, I'm going to leave this behind and go into completely new sport. What were those conversations that you were having and and what were some of the things that you went through to make that switch? So there were lots of things that were happening, but um it helps. So my husband is also a professional bike racer. We've done our careers in parallel. Um, and he was making this switch at the same time. So that was really helpful for me because I had someone safe that was going to do the same thing. And we were moving from a team that we had both raced on to a new team that we were both going to race on. So that was key. Um, in retrospect, I should have done it pretty much like cold turkey. I should have done the switch fully. But in that first year after Tokyo, we kind of dabbled in both. So we did this cross country Olympic, which is for people who don't know, it's like an 80 minute race. You do short tracks, which are 20 minutes and you do the full course, which is about 80 minutes. And so we did a little bit of that. And we also did this new discipline for us of marathon racing and gravel racing. And these events are like four to 12 hours. So it was quite a large spread. So we were doing both of those in the first year. Um, and this year, actually 2024 will be the first year that I don't do any of that shorter cross-country Olympic discipline so in retrospect I should have switched fully but I I kind of like gave myself a soft exit but at the time it was really tough because I felt like I had this perception that people go to marathon or gravel to retire and I was like am I like <laughs> am I off for greener pastures like is this it and I I laugh about it but I really struggled with it um I think in retrospect that perception was 
not true and even more so not true now like this discipline is incredibly competitive um but I think I had that perception back to media because it's these events aren't televised as well as XCO so it gives you that perception that it's not as professional or as like as competitive but it's it's just because that's where our attention has been directed um anyway so I struggled with that but mostly it was just kind of like learning what I valued and I just had this conversation with someone earlier today but the Olympics were really important for me because people said they were really important and I had to learn that no like as when you're an adult like unless you're you can't continually seek approval by doing things that other people think are important or you're going to waste your life so if switching to this discipline I kind of had to figure out like is this important to me do I actually like is this cool do I like it and my answer to that was yes um so I've started to feel more and more free over the last couple of years doing this um yeah and also just found this more internal sense of motivation that's really helped because it's not for a qualification or for like um yeah, for validation because of an existing institution that people think is worthwhile. It's just like for me and I've, so it's been great, I guess. So with this change in the new disciplines, what have been kind of the biggest changes you've gone through from a training side and also uh, within racing as well? There's a lot. Um, so in overall training volume has not really changed for me. I'm, I am a high volume person or I historically have been. So that stayed about the same. Um, but I've had to distribute it differently throughout the year and do a little bit, um, do intensity a little bit differently. So I used to split about 50, 50, 50% 50 of my time mountain bike, 50% of my time road bike. And now it's probably more like 70 30 in favor of the drop bar bike so just um a little bit more consistent pedaling and a little bit less technical work um yeah less technical riding um but you lose a little bit of intensity with that because mountain biking especially where i was living in the lead up to the in the lead up to the olympics on vancouver island it's incredibly punchy everything's really high torque it's like you, you do a thousand intervals when you're out mountain biking so We've had to figure out how to structure training a little bit differently. And now I do a lot more um, structured and consistent pedaling threshold. And I'm working up to doing more um, like VO2 work as well. So um, we're not in that phase yet this year, but the overall, I've become more polarized. The overall intensity distribution, I do more intensity I'm doing about the same volume, but probably more of it is I'm doing less like medium stuff that just happens because you're out mountain biking, if that makes sense. Um, I forget what the second part of your question was, but overall training is like similar, but and looking at a bird's eye view of my training, you wouldn't see anything different, but the distribution of it's quite a bit different. Um, just a little further on that training side, like, do you do all of your riding outdoors or are you somebody who enjoys or spends time on the indoor trainer? What does that look like for you? I do a lot of time on the trainer. Um, in past, we recently, so I grew up in Canada. I grew up north of Toronto. I've always done trainer riding, um, usually until after Christmas. And then in January, we would go somewhere warm. This year, we escaped in December as well so I've done less trainer volume this year but um typically I'll do uh, like a total of two full three-week blocks on the trainer in winter um maybe broken up a little bit but it ends up being like I do a lot of Zwift <laughs> I'll put it that way and a lot of structured intervals on the trainer which are really they make you fast um but you just have to make sure not to you know overdo it because you can in a lot of different ways with the trainer you can overdo it yeah totally yeah we are so many of our athletes are are challenged with that of when they get on Zwift and they're like maybe a little inflated FTP or somebody chasing them it can be a dangerous spot if you if you don't know how to trust in yourself during that for sure exactly yeah um talking you mentioned a little bit about it but you're like training environment so you said you spend some time um outside traveling and stuff like that tell me a little bit about like your training setup and why you've kind of chosen the locations you have for like your home base 
as well as maybe where you go on uh, on training camps. And further to that, with the environment part, I think who you surround yourself is so important. So like, who are you typically training with during that time? Is it just you and your husband or a full team? So kind of location and, and training mm -hmm. setup from a partner's perspective. So my home is, we recently moved um, east of Montreal in a little town called Waterloo, Quebec, which is near Bromont, um, very close to the Vermont border. Uh, and it has incredible riding, um, dirt, gravel, pavement, mountain biking. It's incredible. So that's a large part of why we moved there. Uh, you just do contend with a lot of winter as well. So um, I guess I'll, our our typical year start is at the end of October or beginning of November. So I'll kind of go through just like a general year of where we are and why we've chosen that. So uh, November into December, we do our, it's, we're back training after a little off season. Um, it's pretty unstructured and we're just getting into the swing of things. So we stay at home. Um, if the weather's really bad, we'll do some, we'll do trainer riding. Um, we do some skiing, running, lots of running actually, uh, kind of change it up. We're always in the gym as well year round. Um, so more gym foundational time at that time of year. And, um, when I say we, it's myself and my husband. So in, in Quebec, it's myself and my partner, and we found a way to train together pretty well. Obviously it's easy on the trainer cause you're just sitting beside each other. Uh, but when we're out on the road, we'll do things like, um, I'll run flicks and he'll run knobby tires or something like that to make us more even, um, or I'll just ride in his draft. Uh, but we do a lot of training together and then kind of at the turn of the new year is when we start to go away. Uh, you need to get a little bit of the, those more consistent high volume opportunities and just ease. Like you need to do training where it's easy so that not every single day has a layer of resistance to it. Um, and typically we go to California. So this year we came to Santa Cruz for January right through till now at the end of February. Um, we haven't locked in to the weather with the rain, but it'll either often be Santa Cruz or so SoCal and kind of the Thousand Oaks area. Um, and we choose those because of the, the climbing availability to us, um, in the canyons here and on the mountains. Um, yeah. And just like the safety of the roads, the reliability of the roads, especially in Santa Cruz, you can ride for, you know, six hours and hardly see a car when you're in the mountains. Um, and this year we deliberately added in Santa Cruz because of the mountain bi mountain biking opportunities, which are a little harder to come by in SoCal. Um, we've tried every location. Like we've been to South Carolina, North Carolina, Arizona, California, and we keep coming back here um, just because we like it and it's reliable. There's a lot of mountain bikers that live here as well. So in the new year, we kind of, we try to add in group rides and, and add in rides with other people. Um, partially so we don't drive each other crazy and also because you know you need you do need those group tactics and you need to not always be the strongest one that you're riding with and not always be the weakest one and when I ride with Andrew I'm always the weakest one so it's good to have other riding partners as well um and also just like social fulfillment um but yeah then after February we're kind of we kind of are on the road for racing so we'll go back and forth from our home base in Quebec uh and to venues kind of all over mostly North America, but some European and international ones as well. Very cool. And do you have a coach that oversees all of your training or is it uh, just something that you guys kind of program yourself for a combo of both? A kind of a combo of both. So I, um, I was coached for a very long time up until the Olympics. And since then we've been kind of, um, Andrew's fully self-coached and I'm kind of more overseen is sort of self-directed and with some advice and help from trusted people. I don't trust myself to fully take the reins, So it's kind of um, a collaboration now. Very cool. And you touched on this a little bit earlier, so I wanted to dive a little further into it, but how much like data and science is involved in your training? You had talked a little bit about power before, but I'd love to hear your perspective on it and how much of a role it plays in your kind of everyday and within your racing too. Um minimal compared to others so I first of all so there's kind of when people talk about cycling numbers they tend to talk about watts and they talk about weight so I'll address the weight thing I have not weighed myself in several years so I don't know what my weight is I couldn't tell you what my watts per kilo are I have absolutely no clue and it doesn't seem to impact my performance negatively at all so that we can kind of deal with right away and then in terms of watts 
um, Watson heart rate is what I would train with. Um, I also, you know, track like kilometers and elevation and stuff, but that's just because I think it's cool. I like tracking up those numbers, but um, I don't really look at it. I don't do anything to a prescribed wattage. So whether it's threshold, VO2, full gas sprints, like nothing is to a wattage, it's to an effort level. So whenever I have a structured set, it's always to an RPE or uh, rate of perceived exertion. And then I'll look at the data after the fact to see like if I'm improving, but it also gives you, you know, like, is your heart rate to power balance out of whack and you're tired or is this showing? Yeah. Like I look at it to, to give indication of whether, where I'm at, if I'm improving, if I'm too fatigued, et cetera, but nothing, nothing during it. Like when I, even when I'm doing intervals, I don't have a power screen up. I just have cadence and heart rate because it's irrelevant. Like if you just, do your effort and you know what threshold should feel like, especially I should at this point in my career, you just do it. And then you look after. I love that. Yeah. And just let the power be what it is on the day. If you stay in that effort zone, I'm, I'm telling my athletes this so much, especially with things like Swift where there's erg mode and it's like your threshold could change so much day to day. And also like so much of this data is just wrong these days. So it's like, yeah. And like power meters can vary within themselves between power meters. Like there's no erg mode in real life. Like you're not going to do that when you're out racing, but yeah. And, and I mean, again, I won't get, I don't want to give you the impression that it's all rosy. Like I'm tempted to look at Watts and I get down on myself if they're bad and whatever but it's just it's not a useful tool when you're actually doing the effort unless there's a situation where you need to use it as a ceiling I think so like if you're trying to do a tempo effort and you really don't want it to be too hard you don't want it to turn into threshold and that sensation might not be as much of an indicator then I then you might use it just to keep you keep the reins pulled back but otherwise like it's just not it's it's uh it's not that helpful I don't think I think people are honestly using power the opposite way these days is like, it's their basement. And it's like, I always need to beat that number where more and more. Yeah. I get my athletes. That's your ceiling on the day. Like, please do not do your first interval harder than that, or go over this at any point and you will be in a good spot and be able to come back the next day and do it again and absorb the training. It's, it's Yeah. And like realistically in a training cycle, your Watts probably should be dropping a little bit if you're properly overloading yourself so you shouldn't be able to beat your best every day and you, your best should happen on race day <laughs> so don't expect to see it in training yeah don't waste it there save it for when you really want it yeah exactly very cool um and then talking about some aspects off the bike so what are some of the the really key things that you do in your day-to-day off of the bike to make sure that you can be performing day in day out and be able to crush your races i've been really focusing on sleep lately so well in the last couple of years um sleep is always something i've struggled with with um first of all when you're under fueled uh insomnia is a side effect um so i've always had trouble sleeping that's much better now um so i'm really focusing on that and that means I've had to be pretty diligent, diligent about trying to make a sleep hygiene routine. So we're trying not to, you know, watch anything or look at screens after eight. Um, and like I said, or I hinted at, sleep is also super dependent on hydration and fueling. So if those things are adequate, you will sleep better. Um, so that's one thing. Um, I'm making sure and this is related to, I'm also making sure I'm not going to bed hungry, whether or not I trained that day. Sometimes I stress over it but I always have like a second like after dinner I always have a protein heavy snack before bed it doesn't matter like what day it is and that helps um with recovery and sleep um one thing that people don't think about is when you're at home and you're on the trainer go outside like if I am not deliberate about it I'll spend an entire day where I have either just been in the house or in the basement um so I try to make sure that I go outside and get like sunlight and fresh air um which really helps with there's a correlation between my HRV and my recovery. Um, other than that, just like I'm a student, I'm a grad student. So just trying to make sure I'm balancing periods of stress and recovery and using my school in a positive way, trying to balance out racing instead of adding stress, which I'm not always successful at, but yeah. How far into your program are you? I know that you uh, you have a bachelor's in kinesiology and you have a pretty cool uh, PhD. Um, so 
So talk a little bit about your master's. Yeah, so I'm I'm in the process of finishing up writing up my master's thesis. So hopefully I'll defend in the next month or two. Um, and that's just the process by which you go in front of a committee, explain your project, and they decide whether or not you get your degree. And then I will be continuing on with my PhD this fall. Um, and it it uh, is an extension of my master's work. So what I'm looking at in this um, in the study that will earn me my master's is parent-child co-participation in mountain biking. So our lab is very focused on positive youth development through sport, which encompasses um, psychological things, but also performance. It's not one or the other. Um, and I'm looking at this unique context in mountain biking where it's not so much an organized sport yet, and parents and kids often start together and continue riding together. So looking at the developmental implications of that, uh, and we're hoping to continue that on um, through the doctoral stream as well. Um, but I'm doing some side projects too. So we are actually, we have a paper under review right now that looks at the the culture of gravel cycling and what this means to and for individuals and how it's contributing to increased adult uh, sport participation rates and leisure time physical activity rates. So it's all very nerdy, but basically what, like just, I, I research why sports are good, ways they could be better and how they impact people. Well, I brought it up because I think that those are topics that our audience would be interested in. We do have a few gravel riders and mountain bikers mm. that would, would love to check out that research. And and uh, so super cool. Um, wanted to also jump back to um, the mental part of it, because you're talking about you're balancing all of these things. I would imagine that that takes quite a bit of capacity. And I know that when I'm overloaded and I try to do a lot of things all at once sometimes I find my mental capacity shrinks when I really need to focus so like on Instagram you had mentioned and I wrote it down because I love it it's racing bikes is terribly awesome and awesomely terrible um so what does that mental preparation work with the performance as a cyclist and how do you balance that with all of the things that you're doing so I think um I don't know exactly, I'm going to butcher the saying, but it's something about like energy flows where your attention goes or something like that. And it's, it's very true. So you have to, your attention is where you put your attention is a choice and things are only real to you if you give them headspace. So I have to be very deliberate about as soon as I swing my leg over my bike, that's my reality. I'm not a student at that moment. I'm just, I'm a cyclist and this is my job right now. Um, and to, there's a few ways that I help achieve that. So I do a little bit, of, especially if it's a structured workout, I'll do a little bit of journaling and just write down mantras or mental cues that I'm going to use within the workout. And that kind of sets my headspace. But I also don't use music or typically ride with like headphones or have my phone's always on do not disturb. So there's just not that temptation to check your email or be distracted by anything that's not what you're doing. Um, so that's a pretty, pretty necessary strategy for me. Um, and it, it works the other way as well. Like I think school provides a pretty good break for you to get a little bit of mental space between the bike. So I, I get home from training, I'll eat lunch. And while I'm eating, I might like, you know, like look at my file from the workout and write my training peaks comments and, but then it's done. Then that's it for the day. I'll, I try to resist the temptation to open training peaks up again, or to go into the weeds of Strava later in the afternoon. Like that part of the day has happened and it's over. Um, and you, you bookend it with your comments in your training file. Um, yeah. And then I, I guess with race week specifically in a race week, I'm not a student. That's my sort of policy. So I try to be, um, it's maybe not the full week, depending on the intensity level of the event or the focus of the event, um, whether it's like an ABC or A, B or C priority, but I, uh, I put the books away and my professor is very understanding that when I'm at a venue, it's, that's my job. Mm -hmm. And what I love that you brought up the mantras. Do you, would you be able to share any of the ones that you use in your training? Yeah, they're, they're all silly probably to people, but, um, and it's different depending on the focus of the work or of the workout or where I feel like I'm at confidence wise. But the one that I've used since oh, 2013 is just, I can do this. And I write it in all caps level or all caps. And I kind of like, it's like, I'm yelling it at myself in my journal. Um, 
And I do say that out loud to myself on the road <laughs> when I'm doing intervals. Like, I can do this. Haley, you can do this. Um, but that's one. Um, let go and lean in, which I have recently learned that that's also the title of a hyper-religious podcast. But oh. for me, it means to let go of expectation and lean into the effort. Um, so that, that's a useful one too, because it's, it goes back to that, like, I should be able to do this many watts and I should be able to perform this way. It's let go of that. Like you can't, you just got to let go of it and just lean into what you're doing right now. Don't shy away from it. Um, so those are two pretty common ones. Um, get curious is one for me. Don't be judgmental. Just get curious. Um, yeah, those are the, those are the kind of the three most recent ones I've been using in training. Those are great. So talking a little bit about, uh, last year, if you had hopped into a bunch of, uh, gravel racing and other races, is, is there some highlights that really, uh, jump out at you as some great memories from the past year? Yeah, for sure. I, um, when you sent over the, the show notes and it was, I think one of the questions was, what's your a race that you're most proud of or best memories from a race from last year. And I was like, Oh, I don't know. I didn't feel like I really had any good ones. And then it forced me to think about it. And I was like, Oh, I had, I had ones that I really enjoyed and thought I did well at, but um, yeah, there was one in particular, um, a, a Belgian waffle ride on Vancouver Island in Canada. And it was just, it was just the best, probably the strongest I've ever been on a bike ever. And it was a glorious experience to a long race. It was like seven hours and 39 minutes. And, but it just, it was just good. It was just a good day on a bike. And I, I won, but more so than that, I just felt like strong and there the whole day. And so it was, yeah, that one stands out to me. That's amazing. And I know that we've sort of talked the gamut of like, you know, your mental health advocacy that you do, you race, you have, a, you know, this schooling journey that you're on and you're contributing all of this great research into the world. But you to also talk about, you know, tying this all up that you try to race for a greater purpose. So what would you articulate your greater purpose to be? It used to be very much to try to inspire people young girls in particular are who were always in my mind but um just show them that you don't have to be defined by a diagnosis um I think that uh I've realized that my greater purpose right now is more showing that to myself um and and I think you know maybe people will also see that by extension um but yeah, my purpose right now is just to, to share, to share a love of this type of active lifestyle and how it can positively impact you, um, impact you and your relationships and the world around you, I guess. And when I'm out there, especially in these gravel events and their mass starts and you get to ride with people that, um, you know, maybe they're doing a shorter distance and you've caught up to them or they're you know, they're going to be with you for the first hour, but then they're going to take six hours longer than you. Like it's, um, it's a very real sense of purpose because you're out there doing it with them and sharing in that kind of like the struggle. Um, a lot of people are opposed to the word suffering, but I, I think I own it that sometimes racing is suffering, but it's a choice and it's a chosen suffering. And I think that's kind of powerful, but anyways, um, yeah, I think the purpose for me right now is just showing the the life altering of, of the life altering potential of sports and chasing a physical goal i love that and i i also love what you said about it not being uh, you know not having something define you i think that you can give a lot of hope for maybe some female male athletes who are struggling um and sometimes an eating disorder can feel all consuming and it can feel like this is, you know, this is the only brand that you can have. And you have built this incredibly colorful kaleidoscope of a life that is so rich and full where, you know, this doesn't define you. It's, it's something that's going to be a part of you, but it's not the, it's not the driving force. And I, I think that that gives hope for a lot of people. And so like, just thank you. We're so grateful that mm. you were so open and brave and willing to share because I think that it's going to help so many people. So thank you so much, Haley. Thank you. Thanks for the opportunity to talk about it. 
course. So what's next for you? Um, you have a very full plate, but you know, what, what do you want the next, we'll say like five years to look like for you? Oh goodness. Um, I hope that I am still improving. I hope I, I mean, I'm in this because I, that's what I'm motivated by. I love improving and I love the process of getting better at fitness and skills and all of the whole thing. Um, I hope that I'm still racing professionally and um, being competitive. Like I, I'm just very motivated by being in the fight. It's really, it makes me feel alive. Um, I am adding in some more international gravel events this year and gravel world championships. And so I'm excited to see if I can crack that code. I've always been infatuated with road, but I think maybe more where my niche will be is this gravel discipline. I've never done a road race. So, um, anyways, yeah, I think just, um, I don't have a very clear picture, but, um, maybe I'll be a doctor by the end of the next five years, doctor of philosophy, and I'll hopefully still be racing bikes and all over. Well, that sounds pretty great to me. <laughs> um, yeah. one of the ways that we always end the podcast is, you know, we brought you on because you're one of our endurance icons, but we would love to know who's your endurance icon and why. Oh, this is a, this is a tough one for me to answer when you, <laughs> um, and I don't want this to come across wrong, but I don't really follow people in my own sport and I haven't so much but I do have an, a lot of um a lot of like idols I guess so I've always been a huge fan of Molly Seidel um Jesse Diggins um Clara Hughes you can probably sense a theme here if you know these athletes well or you know their stories um but they're they're just hugely inspirational to me and I love the way that they address these issues that I find myself also facing um Yeah. And then like, I, yeah, if, if I extend the question to who do I draw inspiration from, it's like, it's my family and my, my old coach and my partner and um, my competitors too. But I guess those, those three women that I shared, they're good follows if people are looking to be inspired in a very wholesome, non influency non um, toxic way. They're great. Awesome. Well, thanks so much for sharing that. And it's totally, uh, with, we actually see this a lot where people give and draw inspiration from people who are not in their sport. I think there's so much opportunity to sort of cross pollinate because you can always learn from different athletes and different sports. So thank you mm -hmm. so much for coming on the show. It was such a pleasure to be able to talk to you today. Yeah. Again, thank you for asking. It was nice. Wow. How great was that? I always learned so much from these endurance icons. If you enjoyed the podcast as well, please consider liking us across social media, subscribing to us on YouTube, or giving us a five-star rating on wherever you listen to your podcasts. We appreciate you and your support so much. We wish you happy training, and we'll see you back next week.